Good morning. Um, so you, we've started out Thursday talking about Andrew Jackson, so you know you're, you're in a dork support group. So <laughs> if you want to do some 12 steps here, you have to admit you're powerless over being a dork, because here you are. Uh, it's an important thing. Um, wanted to tell a story I, I've told before, but it, it's, it's in honor of, of Mrs. Bush in many ways. Um, so I was just stopped very sweetly by, uh, by someone who said, oh, I've, I've read everything you've written, which is one definition of hell uh, <laughs> for the poor, poor, poor man. I was like, uh, need to get out more, sir. Um, but uh, about 10 years ago, I was at the National Book Festival on the Washington Mall. And I, w I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson, and a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, <laughs> and said, or ever, and said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, yes, you know, that's hard to argue with. And uh, <laughs> she said, I just, I love your books. Will you wait right here? I'm going to go buy your book, and have you signed it? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I thought this was exactly the world, the way the world's supposed to be, because a woman ran up to me, and she was going to buy the book. So in my world, it was a twofer. So... Um, uh, I'm standing there thinking this is exactly the way the world is supposed to work. She goes away, <clears throat> she comes back, swear to God, with John Grisham's latest novel. So, <laughs> so, whenever I think I'm the most anything in America, I remind myself that somewhere in the country there's a woman with a forged copy of The Runaway Jury, right? Because <laughs> you have to sign it. So. I was at that point writing my book about President Bush, uh, which took 17 years. It was supposed to be posthumous, but the son of a bitch wouldn't die until recently. Uh, and it was, I was going to Maine to, uh, to see the Bushes that next, that was a Saturday, I was going for, up for Sunday, and I'm sitting at the table, and I tell this story about being mistaken for Grisham, totally honestly, to fish for compliments. And Barbara Bush looked across the table in that inimitable way of hers and said, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, he, he's a very handsome man. So it was the worst weekend of my life. Um, so I'm very careful about compliments. Uh, here to talk about uh, the soul of the country, so no pressure. Um, I wanted to explain how the book came about because I, I think the experience I had is uh, almost universal. I suspect everyone in the room, no matter where you fall in the political spectrum, over the last two years, you have been unhappy. You were unhappy in 20, if you voted for the incumbent, you believed that the fact that from 1980 until 2016, the fact that eight out of 10 national elections had a Bush or a Clinton on the national ticket, had not produced the country you wanted. You believed that the Obama presidency had marked a, a shift that you didn't like, and you decided to take a flyer on the self-acknowledged most unconventional nominee in modern, uh, in political history, major party nominee. So you were that unhappy in 2016. You are now unhappy because there was a central claim as part of that movement, which was to build a wall, and that doesn't seem to be happening. If you voted against the incumbent and for Secretary Clinton, let's be honest, you have set your hair on fire three times today, <laughs> right? And you're hoping that Jamie has a reign for Zoloff outside, right? <laughs> so, we are at a, a moment where there is very little about which to be affirmative in the broad American public square. And that's a dangerous place to be. My, I was sitting at home in Nashville right after the Charlottesville violence in 2017. Phone rang, it was my editor at Time Magazine. She said, do you have anything to say about, uh, I'm interested in the history of hate and the history of fear. And so I sat down and wrote an essay about four moments that had produced spasms and tragedies like the violence, the neo-Nazi violence in Charlottesville. And it stuck with me for the next couple of uh, months, which in Trump terms of time is like 17 years. Uh, and I decided that one of the things I got tired of throughout 16 and 17 unto this hour is this argument that 
you know what, if, if you're anti-Trump, you know what, this isn't who we are. To hell it's not who we are. It's very much who we are. Donald Trump is the most vivid manifestation of our worst instincts. But he didn't invent the instincts. He's exacerbated them. He's capitalized on them. Will continue to until the, what Faulkner called the last red and dying evening. But we cannot let ourselves off the hook for this state of affairs. A republic is the sum of its parts. That's the nature of a republic, from Plato through uh, Aristotle, through Machiavelli. Uh, the American founders got this really through the Renaissance, this thinking that our moral dispositions, your disposition and mine, of heart and mind, matter enormously in the full expression of our political community. And so you can't blame it on the other in any sense. So part of the reason for the populist fury of the moment is blaming systemic uh, fears about prosperity, about the ladder to the middle class being broken. Some people blame the other being immigrants. But let's be honest, there are a lot of people in elite circles, left of center, or center now and left of center, who want to blame the state of things on the president as the other. It's not wildly productive, would be my unsolicited opinion to you. This is about us as much, if not more, as it is about him. And so what we have to do, and my enterprise, my project in this book, and in talking about it, was to figure out what history can tell us to arm us for that daily battle. And it's not only daily, it's minute to minute now because of that computer in your pocket, that bizarre window on the world that too often becomes the world. One of the things that I try to tell my children who are 16, 14, and 10 is just because you have the capacity to express an opinion quickly does not mean you have an opinion worth expressing quickly. <laughs> um, and people all laugh, but then they do it anyway. Uh, and I'm in the opinion business, and believe me, I have a lot of opinions I express that I shouldn't. Um, I settled on the idea of the soul of the country, because in Hebrew and in Greek, the word soul means breath or life. And so when, in Genesis, when God breathes life into man, uh, that word can be translated as soul. In the New Testament in Greek, when Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends, the word life could be translated as soul. It's the essence of who we are. And I resist the idea that there's a soul that can therefore be captured by outside forces, either good or bad. I think it's just who we are. And within that soul, there's a perennial struggle between our worst instincts and our better angels. And the eras in American history, which is my central concern, that we wish to emulate and that we wish to commemorate are the ones in which our better angels won out for at least an afternoon over those worst instincts. My friend Jack Danforth is here, who's both a senator and a priest, so he's got a lot of things going on, um, <laughs> and, and a Cardinals fan. Uh, but that's what the way our, every individual works, right? I don't know about you all, but if I get to the end of the day and 51% of the time I've done the right thing, that's a hell of a good day. And there aren't many of them. Why would a republic be any different? It's not some, the, the state is not a clinic, deep state or shallow state, whatever it is, is not some clinical entity. It is, in fact, a living organism of which we are all constituent members. So, but we're not going to always win. We're not going to always lose. The point of history, the point of reality, is to struggle on through what George Eliot called in Middlemarch, the dim lights and tangled circumstance of the world. So let's think back. What are the moments, and if you can think of one, when we get to the end here, raise your hand and we'll, we'll talk about it. Find me a moment in American history that you would like to go back to 
where we did not, where the era was not defined by a more generous interpretation of what Thomas Jefferson meant when he wrote that all men were created equal. <laughs> Find me a restrictionist, closed fist moment that you want to recover, and we'll talk about it. The moments we commemorate are the ones where we broadened our vision, where we dealt, where we opened up to the free movement of men and ideas and people and goods. That's the great American insight. Now, the most important sentence in the English language was probably, all men were created equal. Now, I, I just mentioned this over there, but as a Tennessean, I have to make this point. Um, there, there are two important things about Tennessee. One is we liberated Texas from Spain. <laughs> and so without us, they would still be part of Spain. And the first time I met George W. Bush, I made that point, And he said, <laughs> that's funny, asshole. <laughs> um, um, that's actually the key is the hand. Uh, people, don't, people forget the hand. Um, do you all know, totally parenthetically, do you all know the Saturday Night Live story about W? Uh, quickly. Um, and he's a good sport, you know. So he had Lorne Michaels and Will Ferrell come down to the library recently uh, to talk about the presidency and humor. And they're standing backstage beforehand, and he says, Bush says to him, says, I made your jobs pretty easy. <laughs> and they say, what do you mean, Mr. President? He said, I gave you strategery. <laughs> and... And Farrell and Michaels look at each other, and they say, should we tell him? And they said, you know, Mr. President, we made that up. And Bush was crushed. <laughs> he said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, but I gave you misunderestimated. Anyway, um, <laughs> totally parenthetical. Um, but the, the most important sentence written in the English, back to the important stuff. Uh, the most important sentence written in the English language, which is, I, I also say, because there's a great Texas story about a, a gubernatorial candidate who was running against the teaching of Spanish in the public schools and said on the stump, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. <laughs> so, so I'm careful. I'm careful about that. Um, but the American story, the American story is about more generously interpreting that sentence. That sentence has inspired, my friend Gary Kasparov is here, it has inspired people around the world. It is a sentence that continues to change lives. And God willing, will continue to. So here's, here's why I think, uh, let me just run through uh, three or four eras, just to give you some perspective and proportion. These are moments where our better angels were under siege. And yet, here we are. We got through these moments. Um, for those who are worried about a crackdown on the press, that in fact, and, and the crackdown on immigration, 1798, John Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, giving him the power to deport individuals by presidential fiat and to close down presses with, who were printing things with which he disagreed. 1798, the country was not a year, that was not a decade old. The Republic was not a decade old yet. For those who worry that the, if you're on the pro side of Trump, uh, if you slip through somehow, uh, um, if you got around the wall, uh, they're not gonna have valet at the wall, just so y'all know. I don't know if you know this. I don't know if Trump knows that, but going to come as a shock to Wilbur Ross. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, just, it's a cheap shot, but that's all right. Uh, he, the, if you worry about Trump, if you're worried that the world is too critical, George Washington thought about not standing, I don't say running because no one ran against him, standing for a second term because people had been so critical of him. The guy never had an opponent. James Madison wrote a farewell address after the first term before uh, in 1792. Uh, so this is a perpetual and perennial thing. If we had been here 100 years ago, 
today. 1919, the women in the room, about half of you, could not vote. You have not yet voted for 100 years in this country. If we had been here 55 years ago in my native region, we lived under functional apartheid, denying people the right to vote based on the color of their skin. 50 years ago in the presidential election of 1968, George Wallace of Alabama, running on an explicitly segregationist platform in the lifetime of, is there anybody who wasn't alive in 1968, honestly? Okay, two people. There are two people here for whom I am telling a Lord of the Rings-like story. Okay, should I speak up? No. Um, Wallace carried 13% of the popular vote and five states on a segregationist platform. And you're telling me this is all new? That social media created this? Have you ever heard of Reconstruction? What was Dr. King doing? What was the Klan doing? So what did we do? What did we do? All right, 100 years ago, 1919, in the midst of economic transformation, dislocation, the 1920 census was the first time a majority of Americans lived in cities and not on farms. A dislocation in terms of culture, 1921, radio goes national. Again, that was the social media of the age. Think about it. If you were a householder in the United States of America until 1921, you totally controlled the culture that came into your family's lives. Maybe a kid would bring back a library book that you didn't approve of. But your world was your neighbors, the newspapers to which you subscribed, and the books which you might buy. All of a sudden, you buy this radio. You invest in it. And there are these people in this place called Hollywood or New York who are creating culture that's coming into your life. News comes into your life more immediately. That was the information superhighway, and people felt totally discombobulated by it. Same with, uh, same with the economic transformation and immigration, which was going up. What was the reaction? Did we throw open our arms? No. The Ku Klux Klan was refounded at Stone Mountain, Georgia in uh, 1915, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and grew to three to five million members. Now, you may not be surprised that the uh, governors of Texas, Georgia, and Louisiana were members of the Klan. That's probably not stunning to you. How about this? Oregon, Indiana, and Colorado. Explicitly, members of the Klan. Hugo Black, future Supreme Court Justice. So what happened? Harding and Coolidge did the right thing. It's almost impossible to, uh, to imagine. Are you all getting buzzed? Yeah. Is it me? Someone's hearing A. There's a shock. I've reached the point where I don't want to hear anything. <laughs> the, um, that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Harding and Coolidge did the right thing. They, uh, they took on the Klan. You don't often hear that sentence, do you? They were quite good about it. They believed that, in fact, while political equality was something entirely different, uh, they did believe that the country should open its arms to immigrants. They were doing jobs that people, that were helping the economy. There was a huge racial backlash. There were, a, here we are in California. It was argued by James G. Blaine on the floor of the United States Senate that if we didn't restrict immigration from Asia into California, it was going to create, and I quote from the floor of the United States Senate, a yellow empire from California to the Rockies. Samuel Gompers, the great labor leader, wrote a book saying, warning about the Asiatic influence because Asians were coming in and had the audacity to work harder for less money than white people. It's all in the record. It's all 100 years ago. So what happened? Uh, we restricted immigration pretty severely in 1924. Uh, it was a, a ferocious debate, but it was a legislative solution ultimately. 
And we basically, the Supreme Court was a critical factor here too. Remember, anti-Catholic sentiment was as ferocious as traditional racism or anti-Semitism in this period. So in Oregon, a Klan-dominated legislature passed a law saying that every school-aged child had to go to a public school. So what do you think that was about? It was an attack on the nuns. They were attacking parochial education. They wanted to shut down the Catholic schools. Catholic schools were the Sharia law of that time. The Supreme Court ruled against it, said no. There's a case in New York. Uh, New York State passed a law because the Klan was engaging in vigilante violence, saying that the Klan had to publish the names of its members. The Klan countersued and said it violated their First Amendment freedom of assembly. Supreme Court said no, it was not like the Kiwanis Club. That in fact, you did, if you engaged in this, you had to take your mask off, essentially. And suddenly, being a member of the Klan wasn't so great when your neighbors knew. You know that old line that's on the coffee mugs and the needlepoint pillows? Character is what you do when no one's watching. It's also what you do when you know someone's watching. Cut to 1933, March 4th, Friday, March 4th, 1933. Franklin Roosevelt stands on the east front of the Capitol uneasily balanced on 20 pounds of steel, having been struck down in August of 1921 by polio, and offers the great line that we all remember. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, paralyzing fear. Isn't that wonderful? He called it paralyzing fear. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you don't need Dr. Freud to think about that. Uh, it's a great point. But that's the line we all remember, and I think given the bookish crowd, you all should, uh, it's worth thinking about. I think one of the reasons we remember it is it's on the first page of To Kill a Mockingbird. That's how Ms. Lee grounds the story in the summer of 1933. She said that Makem had just been told that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Um, the line that got the greatest cheer, and it chilled, the word is Mrs. Roosevelt's, it chilled Mrs. Roosevelt was when he said that the present crisis was of such scope and duration that it might require wartime-like executive powers in order for him to solve the crisis of the Depression. And the crowd roared, and it worried Mrs. Roosevelt enormously because it felt as though they were ready for a dictator. And remember, this is the spring, late winter of 1933. One out of four American men are out of work. There are rolling riots and food riots in Iowa. There was a live question about whether democratic capitalism could survive a decade with two alternatives, European-style totalitarianism, what Churchill called wonderfully the lurid flames of Nordic self-assertion. <laughs> the guy couldn't write a bad sentence, isn't that great? <laughs> and the baleful lights of Soviet Bolshevism. These were the two options. Communism was not, in 1933, it was still an option. A lot of, by the way, just parenthetically, a lot of the folks that Joe McCarthy went after in the 1950s had been students in the early 1930s and had gone to socialist meetings or communist meetings trying to see what it was about because capitalism wasn't working. Douglas MacArthur, against the advice of his chief of staff, a young guy named Dwight Eisenhower, uh, in 1932, 33, leads an attack on the bonus army, World War I veterans who were starving and came to Washington trying to get their pensions. They were camped in Anacostia. MacArthur said, there is incipient revolution in the air. Launched an attack. There was a Wall Street cabal. Bankers from Wall Street tried to hire the head of the American Legion. Here's a name you have not heard in a long time. Smedley Butler, isn't that a great name? General Smedley Butler, two-time recipient of the Medal of Honor, head of the American Legion, Wall Street tries to bribe him to summon the American Legion to Washington in order to turn it into a fascist army that will remove Franklin Roosevelt. Things have been kind of bad before. That would be breaking news, you know, on the Chiron, on the cable. That night, President Roosevelt's having a glass of bourbon and going to bed like, which is the way we should all go to bed. <laughs> and a brain, uh, brain truster, Rex Tugwell, comes to him and says, rather pretentiously when you think about it, 
Uh, Mr. President, if you succeed in solving the Depression, you will go down as our greatest president. But if you fail, you will go down as our worst. And FDR looked at him and said, if I fail, I'll go down as our last. <laughs> One of the best-selling books of the 1930s was by Anne Morrow Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh's wife. It was called The Wave of the Future. In her view, the wave of the future was not democratic capitalism. It was European totalitarianism where a strong man might have to seize control of the media and the means of production in order to meet the challenges of a global system of governance, of a global uh, economy that was becoming ever more intertwined. Gee, you know, as Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> so how do we get through it? We got through it in large measure because Franklin Roosevelt, who wonderfully said that the two redeeming features of American character are that we have a sense of hope and a sense of humor. And he insisted that the Madisonian experiment in self-government was not going to end on his watch. And he uh, attacked things with, as he put it in a speech in September of 32 uh, in Pennsylvania, he said, we, what the times require is a spirit of bold, persistent experimentation. If a method, try a method, and if it fails, admit it frankly and try something else. But above all, try something. And he did it. We had two different New Deals. We rolled into the 1936. Uh, we carried every state except Maine and Vermont. And then he turned around and screwed it up, tried to pack the Supreme Court. His numbers fell. Uh, it was, it's the give and take, the ebb and flow of, of, of politics. But he absolutely insisted on the viability of the institutions that we all now accept as a given, and that many of us are worried about being under special siege. Joe McCarthy, Lincoln's birthday, 1950, the McClure Hotel in Wheeling, West Virginia. Let me tell you something. The Wheeling, West Virginia Lincoln birthday dinner was not a tier A assignment for a junior senator. He, they wouldn't send him anywhere else. So he shows up. He has been sold as Roy Cohn, his lawyer, and later Trump's. Sometimes you don't even have to make it up. Um, Roy Cohn says that McCarthy bought anti-communism the way other people bought a car. It was the means to an end. It was a vehicle. There were communists in the government after 1945, but Truman got most of them with a loyalty program that civil libertarians hated. But it was a pretty tough one. So one of the reasons Truman reacted so viscerally to McCarthy is McCarthy was trying to do something, was basically saying that Truman hadn't done his job. He says, I have the names of 205 communists in the Department of State. The number wandered down to 57. Never actually found any. He was a fascinating figure. See if any of this seems familiar. He was a freelance figure with one foot in traditional power structures, but a keen understanding of the media of the day. And he understood that hyperbole moved much more quickly into the public consciousness than nuance ever would. He understood newspaper deadlines, which is like talking about Thermopylae, I realize. But he knew that the afternoon papers closed at noon. So he would call press conferences at 1140 and say, I am seeking communists in Des Moines. They didn't have time to check. But a United States senator had just said there were communists in the middle of the country. Headlines go across America. Senator seeks red in Midwest. Morning papers closed at midnight. You can tell the end of the story. 11.40 p.m. He'd stumble back from the uh, uh, hotel where he drank, and he'd give a press conference. I have, I'm redoubling my efforts to seek the red in Des Moines. They didn't have time to check. A United States senator just said he's redoubling his efforts. Boom. There he goes. It went on and on and on. The head of the Denver paper, Palmer Hoyt, led this media debate about should we simply report what people in power say even if we don't think it's true. I love my colleagues in the press and the historical ranks, but man, we've been to this movie before. So what happened? The women were right, not surprisingly. 
Margaret Chase Smith, four months after Wheeling, gives what she calls a speech, the Declaration of Conscience. Go read it. It's fascinating. It's, it's the exact case against McCarthy. He was violating rule of law, violating fair play. He was ruining lives. She only got six cosigners in the spring of 1950. McCarthy dismissed them as Snow White and the Six Dwarves. Four years later, in December, the Senate was with her. The fever broke. So I spent a lot of time on this. Why? Well, how did this happen? It was four years, 48 months, 40, 54 months. It's a long time. Watergate took 28 months. Roy Cohn bears the most interesting witness about how McCarthy fell. And it's a really interesting insight for our time. He said that in 1968, really good book called McCarthy. He said, people got tired of the show. Franklin Roosevelt saw something like this too. In 1935, he was being urged to go on the radio more. And he wrote a letter saying, there is something in the human psychology that cannot stand to hear the highest note in the scale repeated again and again and again. General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, well, he was being urged to go on TV more. He said, I can imagine nothing worse for the American people than to have to look at my face in their living room too much. There, was, there is a certain proportionality to leadership. And the mind share of the incumbent, his cult, the cultural oxygen this man takes up, I don't think is durable. No, no show lasts forever. And he has explicitly cast this as a performance. He said during the transition, right after he threw out Chris Christie's 30 binders, uh, i got a Chris Christie story for you in a second. Um, he said, I want to treat every day of the presidency as an episode, he said this, an episode in a show where I vanquish my rivals. That's how he thinks of this. So don't, let's not be surprised that it unfolds this way. Very quick Chris Christie story. Um, uh, I was out talking about Thomas Jefferson about five or six years ago, and I got a call from Chris. This is before he became Patty Hearst. And, um, <laughs> and he said, I want to talk to you about Jefferson. And Christie's great company, right? He's just fascinating. So I go to Trenton, and we're sitting around, and he says, you know, I'm really more of a Hamilton guy. Now, that means you're an investment banker. That's what that means. Uh, and without thinking, really, I just said, well, that's great, Governor, but, you know, at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. <laughs> and the damnedest thing happened. All the road bridges were closed when I tried to get back into the city. Okay. <laughs> Very unhappy with that. Um, <laughs> McCarthy fell because he overplayed his hand and overstayed his welcome. Civil rights, sir. There is room in the American soul for the Ku Klux Klan and for Dr. King. And this is, this is the battle, and it's perennial. When he stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in a setting that had been pioneered again by a woman, Marian Anderson, remember? 1939, she's invited, marvelous singer, God, she's good. Uh, she's invited by the, uh, to, her management tries to book Constitution Hall, which is controlled by the Daughters of the American Revolution. They refuse to let her sing in Constitution Hall. Brilliantly, Mrs. Roosevelt and the nascent civil rights movement realize this is an opportunity. They put on, a, they say, okay, we'll just use the Lincoln Memorial. They call Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior. 75,000 people on Easter Sunday, 1939, show up on the Washington Mall. Supreme Court was there, a third of the Senate, you can imagine from the North, <laughs> were there. And they studied this forever, they studied this for 25 years, how to use mass movement with the press, how to use that amazing backdrop. And so when King stood there and talked about the content of our character, he was working in a, in a larger tradition. And what was he calling on us to do? He was calling on us to more generously interpret what Jefferson meant. It is not a mistake, I, and not a coincidence rather, not a coincidence that the major civil rights legislation that undid a century of poor Reconstruction leadership unfolded in the same year, 64 and 65, 
that we had the highest per capita income in American history. The post-war boom had enabled people who look like me to say, maybe we can give up this legalized wall that we've built around our culture. It was when we were comfortable that we were able to hope. So I am not a crazy lefty. I'm not a lefty at all, actually. The lefty, left, they wouldn't have me. I voted for Democrats. I voted for Republicans. I'll continue to do that. I'm just, I just want to make the point that no side usually has a monopoly on truth. That does not mean the answer is always in the middle. The answer was not in the middle on slavery. The answer was not in the middle on suffrage. The answer was not in the middle on civil rights. The answer was not in the middle on the Cold War or on World War II. There was not a Brookings Institution appeasement plan for Hitler. There was a, there was a course to take. But it doesn't mean that one party, one tribe, will always have those answers. And the lesson of our history is that the more we listen and the less we talk, the farther we go. One of the insights, I think, of the American Revolution, I, I, I say this to my conservative friends, which is redundant because I live in Tennessee. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I'll wait. Um, <laughs> One of the central insights, and I think the original intent in many ways of the American Revolution, was the ability to give reason a chance in the arena against passion. That's what, that's what this is about. Thomas Jefferson was able to write that sentence, not just because he was a rising young politician of Virginia. He was 33 years old when he wrote that. He was 33, Jesus was 33, it was a big year for them. Um, <laughs> When I turned 34, I was like, Jesus, what have I done? Uh, <laughs> big moment. Um, he was in conversation with the European Enlightenment, the Scottish Moral Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution. He understood that the entire world in the previous two or three centuries heading into Philadelphia, both in 1776 and in 1787, had been a world that had, been gone, that had gone from being organized vertically, where popes and princes and prelates and kings were by either an accident of election or an incident of birth, had had control over all of us. Popes, princes, prelates, kings. To a more horizontal understanding that we were all born with the capacity to determine our own destinies. That shift, I think is the most important shift since Constantine converted to Christianity in the Western world. And Jefferson was able to do it because he was curious and he was a man of reason and not of reflexive tradition. Because what had been going on? The Protestant reformations, the translation of sacred scripture into the vernacular, the rise of the bourgeoisie, Gutenberg, you are here because you love books. Books were made possible by Johann Gutenberg. Democracy was made possible by Johann Gutenberg. That's a case where technology actually did something good, which means that the possibility is still there for this. If we were still relying on the monks to write everything out, there would be much, many, many fewer books on the bestseller list. <laughs> that intellectual curiosity is essential. And I think we have to insist on it on our lead, with our leaders, and we have to insist on it ourselves. I want to leave you with, with, with this. Um, we just lost uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, and I was honored to be able to do his, his life story over, as I said, 17 years, long time. And whenever I think about him, and we talked about him last year, I, I think of him in a frame less with the figures of his time and more with the figures of an older time. I think he has more in common with Washington and the Adamses and the Roosevelts and Truman and Eisenhower than he does with most of the folks of his own time. And 
because character is destiny, and because biography is destiny, and because he was not perfect, he's a great example of how this struggle within the soul unfolded. Because he wasn't perfect. In 1964, when he was running for the uh, Senate in Texas against Ralph Yarborough, George H.W. Bush opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He did it for states' rights reasons. It was an intellectually respectable position. It's the position Barry Goldwater had. But given what we know now, that's not a comfortable thing. And be, let me be clear, in 1988, he wasn't talking about how he'd opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But what did he do in 1968? He's in the House from the 7th District of Houston, of Texas. He votes for fair housing, open housing, on the ground in the week after Dr. King was assassinated, on the grounds that he could not ask American boys to go and fight in Vietnam for liberty and then say they couldn't buy houses in certain neighborhoods back home. So he did one thing in the search for power, and then once he had it, he took active steps to vote against his interest. 1988, he ran a ferocious campaign against Michael Dukakis. The moment he became president, he did everything he could to govern in an atmosphere of compromise and congeniality. He, he did big stuff that no Republican president, no Democratic president could do anymore. The ADA, the Clean Air Act, remarkable achievements. And to consolidate the Republican base in 1988, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. He got to June of 1990, he realized that to, to keep things going, he needed to cut a deal. And he knew, he said in his diary, in an, one of the great Bush phrases of all time, I got to do this even though I'm going to be dead meat. He did something, he did what he needed to do to amass power, and then once he had it, he did the right thing. That's the best we're ever going to do in a fallen world. And I want to leave you with this. Um, this is a letter that... Um, uh, President Bush wrote to his mother, the formidable Dorothy Walker Bush, in, we think it's 1958. Uh, they lo the Bushes lost a daughter, uh, Robin, to leukemia in uh, October 1953. Uh, George W. had been born in 46. Robin, the daughter, had been born in 49. Jeb had just been born in early 53. When they brought Jeb home from the hospital, Robin was tiring easily. She was bruising. The first time the Bushes ever heard the word leukemia was in the pediatrician's office in Midland, Texas. They'd never heard it. And so uh, they have two more boys, uh, Neil and Marvin. And then this letter was written when, the, when there were four boys in the family. Doro, their last child, had not yet been born. She was born in 59. But I wanted to leave this with you as a sign of, of what a public person's character can be. So this is the voice of George H.W. Bush, writing about the daughter he lost. There is about our house a need, the running, pulsating restlessness of the boys needs a counterpart. We need some starch crisp frocks to go with all our torn need blue jeans and helmets. We need some soft blonde hair to offset those crew cuts. We need a dollhouse to stand firm against our forts and rackets and thousand baseball cards. We need a legitimate Christmas angel, one who doesn't have cuffs beneath the dress. We need someone who's afraid of frogs. We need someone to cry when I get mad, not argue. We need a little one who can kiss without leaving egg or jam or gum. <laughs> we need a girl. We had one once. She'd fight and cry and play and make her way just like all the rest. But there was about her a certain softness. She was patient. Her hugs were just a little less wiggly. She'd climb in to sleep with me, but somehow she'd fit. She'd stand beside our bed until I felt her there. Silently and comfortable, she'd put those precious fragrant locks against my chest and fall asleep. Her peace made me feel strong and so very important. My daddy had a caress, a certain ownership, which touched a slightly different spot than the hi, dad, I love so much. But she is still with us. We need her, and yet we have her. 
We can't touch her, and yet we can feel her. In the um, course of writing the book about him, I, we were down in Houston, and I asked him, it was just the two of us in the room, and I asked him to read that letter out loud to me. And long before he finished, he broke down with an extraordinary level of physical crying. So much so that his chief of staff, a wonderful woman, uh, came in, saw what we were doing, and said to me, why did you want President Bush to read that? And I said, well, if you want to know someone's heart, and before I could finish, the president jumped in and said, you have to know what breaks it. Thank you. <laughs>